Hi, everybody, and welcome to our webinar. Um, this webinar is part of our Compassionate Approaches to Crisis series. And the title of this webinar is Art Making as an Alternative Philosophy of Care During Emotional Crisis. Our presenter is Karen Gerber, and I'll introduce her in a few minutes. Uh, my name is Shira Collings. I'll be the moderator, um, and I'm the youth coordinator at the National Empowerment Center. Um, this webinar was developed in part under a grant from the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration from the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services. The views, opinions, and content expressed in this presentation do not necessarily reflect the views, opinions, or policies of the Center for Mental Health Services, the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration, or the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services. Um, this webinar is being recorded, and so the PowerPoint and the recording will be posted to our website, which is at power2u.org, so that should be available in the next couple days. Um, and at the end of the webinar, there will be a Q&A session, so you're invited to ask questions at any time through the question function, and questions will be taken in the order that they're received, and you're also welcome to make comments using the chat function. I did just want to let you know um, we do have over 400 people signed up for this webinar, so we may not get to every question, um, but we'll make our best effort, um, and um, you're, you're welcome to submit questions after, too. Um, so I'll now introduce our presenter. Um, Karen Gerber is an artist, author, and psychiatric survivor. Writing and art making have been passed down to her through two generations of women artists, along with a respect for the artist's powerful role in society and for the creative force itself. She strongly believes telling our stories is a revolutionary act, one that reinforces the immeasurable value of each of our lives and moves us toward collective justice. Karin currently is the arts editor at the Madden America Foundation, her artwork and writing includes essays, graphic narratives, and poetry, and explores self-empowerment, empathy, identity, normalization of suffering, and the power of creative expression to transform trauma. Her study of Buddhism and improvisational comedy find their way into her work as well. And you can find her work at somethingwonderful.net. So I'm super excited for this presentation. Thank you all for being here, and I'll turn it over to Karin now. Hello, everybody. Oh my goodness, I am so excited to be here. And um, a little disoriented with this new webinar software. So I'll admit to that right away. I am looking um, at uh, my slides and, and uh, have no real uh, way to see you guys, which is hard. Um, I love to see the people who I'm talking to, but I'm sort of imagining everyone here in my living room, maybe one person representing every 100 and um you know made you some tea and sitting in my living room we're just going to have a chat so um you know as i really started to think about doing this presentation um you know i i really thought about the fact that art is actually so much of how i can be here today um my story you know, involves um, overcoming um, uh, a, a diagnosis of bipolar when I was uh, 21, um, if overcoming is the right word, um, integrating um, however you, um, however that, that uh, resonates with you. Um, and uh, art was how I survived. So I'm a real true example of my own philosophy here that art is so powerful um, in the act of healing, in the journey of healing that we take in our lives. So, you know, um, it felt like such a wonderful way to honor art making and the creative force in my life um, to do this talk today. Um, and I also feel it's, it's so important um, right now our world has been through such um, turmoil and upheaval um, with with the pandemic, with um, all these societal um, 
things coming to a head, um, all these things kind of weighing heavy on our hearts. Um, and I, I, I went on, uh, uh, I, I thought that I had had a grasp on how there would be so much trauma. Uh, you know, I knew from the beginning is we will have to heal from this. But man, you know, I was myself pretty shocked when, you know, uh, we, we seem to be in a little bit of a purgatory um, pandemic right uh, right now. But, you know, as things sort of got back to normal, how I was seeing how traumatized um, we truly are from this um, experience um, of 2020 and, and this year as well. Um, so, you know, the, the crisis is, is, is profound um, as far as the emotional suffering um, that around uh, the globe right now and, and a lot of healing needs to be done. So I'm excited to offer um, this uh, talk, which, you know, um, really is um, summarized here in these points um, where we're going to be really covering, um, and excuse me, when I look this way, I'm just looking at my notes. Um, so what I'd like to start, I'd like to start saying this, is let us avoid philosophical conversation. Um, let's just put that aside and all the real kind of conflicts that come with really the debate, you know, or the cultural baggage around definitions um, of artists and, and art and stuff like that. So I want to use this um, as an opportunity to explore and be flexible um, and build on like a, a bare, the bare scaffolding of what the meaning of creativity and expression is like um, the essence of it, um, which at the, is, is really at the core of all of our experiences. Um, so rather than falling into any kind of debate within yourself too, I mean, you know, um, we all have these things that we come to art with, you know, ideas of beauty, ideas of talent, ideas of ability. So, you know, I'm really asking you to just drop all of that. And, um, and also especially the idea of who is allowed to partake in this activity of creating, as well as who's allowed to witness. Um, and just as importantly, um, how people are allowed to participate in this specific, you know, world um, of art making and artists. So a, a real belief of mine is, you know, the inflexibility of our beliefs and of um, the meaning we make are really the death of creativity and growth and change and also healing, right? So, um, so let's really not hold tight um, to the definitions that only serve to limit this exploration, really. Um, and just as I often say, I mean, uh, so much of art making is a spirit of playfulness. So let's go forward um, in discussing this topic with a spirit of playfulness, right? Um, and be able to really just meet it with that intention of, of um, exploration and play. So as it says on this slide, um, we're gonna cover how to treat all selves as artists, life as art, um, believing that our own and others' lives occur on the larger canvas of our lives, viewing all expressions as equal and meaningful, and how to create flow um, for expression, which is finding ways to um, you know, manage uh, and, and uh, you know, understand materials and their meaning, understanding and equalizing all abilities and understanding safe expression. Um, and the obstacles to of, um, expression we'll discuss in detail and I have some uh, uh, examples of artists doing the same. Um, so fear, judgment, shame and paralysis, anger, sadness and oppression can all be obstacles to expression. Um, and um, as I've said um, before, um, I believe art is a container for these things as well. And then finally, we'll end with just kind of reflecting on how this intention 
of um, art making uh, as as this um, way of creating value in our uh, or way of um, understanding and valuing things differently, um, people's expressions, um, and and how to take that into the world, how to how to change our world with this kind of uh, perception, this new new way of looking at things. So, um, and this one uh, may be tough for some people, and it often is, and I get that, I get that. So these are the main assumptions that I'm, that I'm gonna ask you guys to be playful with and experiment with. So all people are creative. Um, so in my experience, so much so, uh, the word creative, um, most of the definitions that I run into can so easily create a pathway for people to tell themselves the story that they couldn't possibly be that. They can't be that. But, you know, I really, I, I assure you that um, creativity is in each and every one of us. We're doing it every day. We are creating our lives. Um, and that takes creativity in every moment. In our relationships, we affect other people in ways that are creative, generative, you know, actions and words, or, or even, um, you know, I have to say, like, some of us paint, but some of us smile in a way that just lights up the room, or some of us dress in, in a really, in a way that's, that's um, expressive, or some of us sing and dance. Um, some of us can diffuse a conflict like nobody else, you know, um, just like without even words just somehow they can diffuse a conflict and some can, you know, gather people together in this really wonderful way. Um, or even, you know, easefully facilitate healing. People um, are creative in so many diverse ways. And sometimes the way we define creativity just shuts that down for us, shuts that down, um, that way of seeing ourselves um, as creative beings. So um, all people are creative. We're going forward with that assumption. Um, and this one too, all people are artists. And this one might be a little even harder for people to, to grab onto. But um, there's this way we discuss art and artists, like I said before, that so excludes um, people, um, some people. And, but if we, if we think of it, um, as we're trying to in this talk, as an intention, when we are hold, trying to hold space for others and looking at what they're doing and saying and how they're expressing themselves as art making, um, we're beginning to see the self as creator. And um, there's, there's such a profound opening up of our perceptions when we see others in this way. And, and I'll, I'll dig deeper into this um, as we go along. Um, but I, I, this is an important point, I think, um, to focus a little bit on as we go forward, because um, I know uh, there, there's, um, as far as definitions and cultural kind of conditioning, there's always some, um, resistance to this idea. And, you know, I say, uh, you know, people will ask me, Karin, you know, do you really think everyone's an artist? And, you know, honestly, um, I always say to them, like, you know, language uh, depends on context so much. And um, if we're not, um, if we're shutting down the, the, the sort of fluidity and and uh, and flexibility of language within different contexts. We're we're just not seeing the potential um, for for new ideas and generating um, change. And and uh, so you know, if we're talking about is everyone a professional artist that that creates art for a living? No. If that's the contents of the context of the conversation, no. You know, of course not. But if we're you know, it, it, talking like we're talking today, where we're just trying to open into some kind of new framework 
new sort of philosophy or 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 just a new way of thinking yes yes i'm i'm going to say you know all people are artists and um this has a lot to do with people's um truth as well and our ability to understand the importance of someone owning and and being able to express their truth you know artists um sort of have this kind of edge right they have that label of artists that allows them to to express themselves in a way that you know let's say you know others can't um or or don't believe um that their that their context is is allowing them to so um you know, and and then in the in the context of say uh, emotional crisis, um, I've been saying a lot to myself is that uh, we have to believe people um, to heal people, and um, you know, um, a lot of what happens in the in psychiatric environments is that the initial assumption is that you are hiding something, or that you're not telling the truth, or they know the real truth the person who's the healer um, in that dynamic um, so there's like a, a hierarchy of truth that's created where the person in crisis is at the bottom um, and the goal of of the healer is to get you in line with their truth um, rather than them being aligned with yours um, so their opinion of what's happening is more important than yours which which compounds suffering in so many ways and of course, we see how this extends um, so much to to the broader world today in politics and economics, social media. Um, so we want to remove the hierarchy of truth and even beauty. And I think seeing uh, others, uh, those in emotional crisis, and and even just people in our day to day lives, and of course ourselves as artists, there's some kind of strange loosening, um, you know where where your truth does become validated and and i'll try to explain a little bit more i know i'm focusing on this point quite a lot um and and i feel like i'm i'm missing some some parts but i'm sure i'll get back um to this this as we go along and of course um you know um art is powerful and empowering um, on an individual and a societal level. So um, expression for me, um, I found my power uh, in so many ways by just expressing my truth um, and finding the the ways I could hold that compassionately and not judgmentally. Um, somehow that is able um, on so many different levels to give us a sense of validation and power and power for me or empowerment um, can lead to healing. Um, in so many ways, we have these kind of stuck truths um, and the process of art making can be a way to unfreeze those truths and um, you know lay them out in the world. And what I want to present here in this talk is really how we can be um, as witnesses. Um, and one element of the talk is as witnesses, how can we build intentions within ourselves that create the container for people to lay those truths before us and for us to have the grounding and the non judgment and the compassion and the openness to let that begin a path to healing and empowerment. So I feel like um, I'm going a little fast um, and I want to slow down uh, just a tad. Um, and I think I think we'll go now um, in a, in a more paced manner, because um, this also is something 
and uh, uh, that that is um, something I, I come up against a lot in my life is the conversation of the power of art. And I've had plenty of conversations with scientists and physicists and technology people, even a hydrologist or two, that um, they they very quickly assume that I'm on my back foot as far as the power of art to make change in the world. And I have done a lot of studying um, over the years and sort of collecting stories that really um, show in, in a clear way um, these larger impacts um, from a work of art. And when I was in college, um, I studied um, poetry and power, um, which was such a wonderful topic. And I learned a bit about several different ways that um, things like um, poetry and artwork, um, singing, uh, I studied lamentation, um, female lamentation, and sort of how um, these things are all used um, to make these really clear um, societal changes and individual changes when we're facing things like, say, grief or or, or um, a conflict between, say, two peoples or um, even in war. And that's uh, the story that I'm going to show you today is um, the story of the Ponte Vecchio Bridge. Um, so the Ponte Vecchio Bridge um, is in Italy. And um, the legend has it, and I'll just read here from this, is that on or near the Ponte Vecchio Bridge, um, Dante, the, he's an author of the Divine Comedy and other books, um, encountered Beatrice, who was his inspiration and muse for writing the Divine Comedy. Um, and he saw her there the second time, and he was deeply, deeply in love with her. And they were both young when uh, this meeting happened, and she died soon after. Um, and this vision of her, um, followed by her untimely death, affected Dante so deeply and permanently it continued to inform his writing ever, uh, until his death. And in uh, 1925, um, he published La Vida no no Nuova, a set of love poems he'd been working on for a decade. Um, and the last sonnet abruptly ends at the time of her death. But the part of the story that's uh, amazing to me and really does show the deep power of art to change just as much as science does, just as much as technology does um, change the world, is that 650 years later, World War II is raging, and the Allies are advancing up the Italian peninsula and in pursuit of the Germans. And the German army is destroying anything um, that they, could aid the Allies, including most of the bridges. Um, across this river, the Arno River. But no one wanted to destroy Dante and Beatrice's bridge. Um, so the story continues that the Germans made uh, radio contact with the Allies, which is just like such an amazing thought. Like, like, hey, you know, I know we're, you know, fighting this, you know, world war, but, uh, you know, a poet, you know, a, po a writer, a poet, you know, fell in love with this major literary character on this bridge, would you maybe not, you know, destroy it? But they both agreed. And that was, they, they and they, no one, the allies didn't bring any, um, you know, tanks or, or military equipment over this bridge. And the Italians um, didn't destroy it, or is, the Germans didn't destroy it. So that agreement, just there, um, just seemed to show um, in my mind just how deeply powerful art making can be. Um, and uh, I've collected so many of these different kinds of stories um, just to face those conversations with people who swear um, up and down that, uh, you know, 
science does more to change uh, the world or politics politics does more to change the world the economy this that, and the other thing but you know don't tell but uh, sometimes i think art is more powerful than all of them combined but don't tell anybody that i said that <laughs> um so as i was saying um earlier uh that this was an important point for me is is um if we are understanding this power um, and ability of art to change um, ourselves and therefore um, in turn um, society and culture and and bring us closer to to collective justice and and um, that that uh, starting here with this concept um, that I dug into a bit in the beginning of how do we treat ourselves as artists? You know, how do we promote these expressions that are making this change, that are that are able to be this profoundly powerful in the world? So, um, you know, as I've said before, you know, we're dropping the baggage of the word artist and art and this and i think i i went enough into that um prior to this um and i'll go deeper into this idea of seeing everything as art so in the context of this talk um definitely try to put different glasses on while um while we're exploring this idea um and and find a way to see everything we create as be as as creatures as beings as human beings um, in this world as at its core having the sole intention of communication and creative communication. So um, as you're sitting there listening to me, maybe you can look at something on your desk and uh, ask yourself why did you put it there? When did you put it there? Who made this? Um, imagine the people behind it. Um, what does it mean? And and what does it say about you? Um, you know, every uh, way we uh, organize our spaces um, is a way of creating art. The way that we um, move, the way that we dress, the way that we speak. Um, let's let's try to see all these things as art making. Um, and and while you know we do that, um, and and we sort of sit perhaps with that kind of new perception. Um, where we're we're, uh, we're looking at a world as little bundles of meaning making, little little paintings. Um, and uh, We'll turn a bit now um, to to now when we're, we're faced with our own or others crisis, emotional crisis. So for me, um, seeing uh, others and myself when I'm in uh, emotional crisis um, as an artist really frees me um, in, in, in various different ways. Um, and I understand that that the idea of the act of expression is is not the only thing required in healing emotional crisis, but it is a step, and it, in in an often complicated process of discovering all the ways you can support yourself or someone else. So I understand that. Um, but often when I'm in crisis, I'm I'm sort of frozen in an inability to communicate what I want to change about my circumstance. Um, and the story just becomes fixed and I'm in, unable to rewrite it. So for me, um, people in dis for, and for people in distress, um, I think it's important that we as witnesses with this new perspective of kind of looking at the world um, as these little bundles of artworks and ways that we're creating communication and meaning in our lives. 
um, is that we um, pay a keen attention to um, others who are in crisis and ourselves, um, to how they're trying to communicate. So we're removing judgment and really taking an important step of being receptive to a new language. So I, I, I think, you know, when we're looking at a work of art, um, we're sort of learning this artist's language. And if we're sort of putting aside a, a kind of judgment or, or, you know, like a, like a criticism where we, we, you know, this isn't good art or this is, you know, where we're putting all that aside, where we're just sort of trying to learn um, from this thing in front of us. Um, and, you know, it, it can be veiled in metaphor often or things even harder to decipher. Um, but if we're willing to create space for them, for this, this person in crisis, um, where they're, they're being seen as artists, I think it changes everything. And um, artists are so often just allowed to express in, in such novel and, and subjectively, you know, strange ways, um, or, um, you know, the, the path for them, uh, you know, as we've defined them in our culture is so much more wide open. So if we're able to see someone in distress as an artist, their path for creation and communication opens um, as long as we learn how to hold that space for them. So, um, and, and like going back to the idea of unfreezing a truth, um, we open that journey for them um, by, by uh, learning to see them in this way. Um, and, and receiving with care and compassion and acceptance our own and others' expressions, a path to healing is, is just a way of reiterating what I've been saying. Um, and we'll, we'll think a little bit more about that as we go along. But um, so uh, I wanted to, in this, in this uh, section, I wanted to tell you a little story about myself um, that sort of um, tells us a little bit, uh, gives a, a solid example of, of what I'm talking about. Um, but, uh, you know, if, if our life becomes our canvas. So, you know, when we're understanding that our speech and our movement, our possessions, our dress and our actions, the personal space that we keep, um, the personal spaces that we keep, like our homes and the, or, or wherever we, we, um, we are in any moment, how we arrange things, um, how we plan and execute our lives. So all these things become art making in my mind. So um, this is a story about me trying to express myself with a salt and pepper shaker, shakers um, on 9-11, 2001. Um, I was home uh, with my parents. I had just had my first um, experience in a mental hospital, my first experience with an altered state um, just before in May. So I had come home and I had been home for a little while before um, September 11th occurred. And my already sort of um, so uh, fractured and confused uh, mind at the time dealing with this sort of state of uh, this altered state, which I had no uh, tools to, to understand or manage or work with. Um, I sat at the table with my mother and I remember moving the salt and sh the pepper shakers and, and, and trying to like moving them closer, moving them farther away. I wasn't using words, but I remember that, that my entire reason for this was telling a story um, with a salt and pepper shaker. And someone, um, you know, sitting with me, you know, say my mother, um, or if you're sitting with someone who's doing something that that is that is uh, you know um, trying to express or create uh, create communication in in a new language, I mean it sounds silly, but if you look at a you know a salt and pepper shaker for for me in the altered state, um, 
there was meaning behind every movement. There was a story being told. So, you know, and, and you know, you could ask yourself what you might have done sitting there at the dinner table with me. You know, what could I have been trying to communicate in that moment? Would you have shut yourself down and said, you know, what the heck are you doing? You know, or, or if you're um, coming from this perspective now of seeing all actions and all things that we say and do and who we are as, as an attempt to communicate as artists, um, you could say, you know, um, did it, you know, does it matter to me that this doesn't have any meaning? Or is this an invitation for me to discover this story, discover this language? What is, you know, as my mother might have said, what is my daughter trying to say with this salt and pepper shaker? Um, and, you know, begin with the curiosity and the non judgment and the questions and the compassion. Um, you know, and, and perhaps discover the language and learn it together, discover the story and perhaps what I needed to change about my experience in that moment. So um, that's a little example. And this leads us directly into this idea, viewing all expressions as equal and meaningful and without judgment. You know, anyone could have seen me playing with a salt and pepper shaker and judged that as an, a, a meaningless and, and in some way inferior expression, right? Um, uh, there's nothing beautiful about it. There's, you know, I'm not doing, I'm not talented at moving salt and pepper shakers back and forth in a different way. And it's not clear necessarily. Um, so, so seeing each of um, the ways we try to communicate, um, which are individual to each of us um, and don't always have to do with words or images even. Um, there are so many ways that we adapt to the way we perceive and the way we experience um, um, and our, our limitations and, and the way we adapt to those as well. There's so many different ways that we try to communicate with one another. So seeing each of those as equal, equalizing the field of expression, that all expressions are meaningful. And always prioritizing the intention of holding those expressions and exploring the expression with the other person. That's also important. So now we go into sort of this, um, idea um, and, and very relatable, I think, um, to a lot of us is um, we can get stuck, um, whatever our, we spoke a bit about cultural baggage around creativity and, and art making and stuff in the beginning. People, if I had a dollar really for every time someone said, you know, I, I can't draw and, and that they made that, that, that the sole thing that determined their creativity, um, I'd be a millionaire. Um, so uh, there are so many ways that we can um, just stop the flow, stop the flow of creativity and expression. And I'm going to talk a few uh, about a few of those things. I just want to check my time here. Great. Um, so first off, uh, you know, understanding safety. Um, you know, in in um, it's a very real thing um, that there are. Um, expressions uh, th that can create um, a feeling of unsafeness of either the person witnessing or the person um, expressing. But I've always found that in many instances where I felt threatened by another person's expression um, or even by my own thoughts or things um, that feel, feel scary or threatening, um, I feel that they're often diffused by asking myself, who is threatened in this moment? And you can kind of develop that question out or draw that question out a bit, you know, um, as simple as, is it me or is it this person? Um, or is it, 
uh, my role as um, uh, uh, um, my role in that moment, um, you know, a culturally defined role, um, or you know, asking that questions can sometimes draw out um, why a person um, is reacting um, to to a situation in a certain way. So I always ask myself that question. Um, and in the case of someone expressing something in a setting of art making that feels frightening or, or directed um, towards towards me in some way, um, it's assuming and always assuming that it is um, that it is them who is feeling threatened um, and acting in defense against something. Um, sort of it sort of seems to diffuse it i mean you know of course there are many levels of this that are that are um important to to understand and in different environments um you know there are certain boundaries uh, sort of built into it but um uh examining what part of me that um is is threatened to i can i can turn compassion towards it and usually that diffuses it because I want, I understand the why better. Why is this expression scary? You know, you putting aside threatening. Just why is this expression scary? Why is my expression scary? Why is this other person's expression scary? Um, you know, always asking where the fear is coming from is is a big question. We actually ask that later on too. Um, and understanding materials and meaning is, is, a, is a big part of this as well, because um, you really have so many different options um, of matching a material with a feeling um, and really just allowing yourself to play. I spoke a little bit about this um, in the talk I did on creativity and a COVID um, where, you know, a bigger brush could, could be, um, you know, a container for so many different kinds of um, uh, uh, emotions flowing through someone. So, so as a witness and as an artist, and as as a person in distress, um, really allowing yourself and the, or the other person to play, and to feel out what materials are feeling like they're matching their inner um, deeper being, their their deeper communication, um, how they're trying to communicate, and. Um, so of course, understanding and equalizing all abilities. I am a true believer that ability is culturally defined in so many ways. Um, as a witness and as a self um, engaging in art making, you have to be ready to adapt um, to a limitation and, and have zero um, uh, shame around that ad adaptation. Um, because the only thing that's creating that shame is is um, a, a sense that that ability is less important than another ability, um, and that's culturally defined. Um, so much harm comes, I think, um, in my mind, from defining ability um, in rigid ways. So. And, and so much joy comes from from really opening that definition up wide um, and saying, you know, to yourself, um, oh, I can't do this, but I can um, do this. And and having zero idea of that being better than this. So that also is an important um, viewpoint to have. So um, I was going to um, have in this section um, as we move into this idea of talking about obstacles to our expression, is is uh, if anyone um, you know wants to put in a chat really quick, quick, um, and I, I won't read out names or anything. Um, I just want to get a sense from you guys. What are the potential repercussions of of expressing ourselves, um, our true selves, our true story? And your true story could be different than the next, it is different than the next person's. Um, but uh, I, I, I'd love to hear if anybody has um, any ideas there. Um, and uh, um, 
if if no one has any um comments on that um you know it, it might be a uh, an example of what i'm talking about um in that uh yes someone said fear of others response people might judge you social exclusion there are so many it's so true um i really just um a deep knowing i think in all be all people that there are there are consequences to expressing ourselves either objective or subjective and and we can talk about that because this is what we're dealing with this is what we're trying to work with and transform into a path rather than a block rather than a wall um Thank you for oh cultural stigma, rejection, hospitalization, and just and being unseen. Yeah, the unseen part. Boy, that is a that is a tough one too. Um, fear of conflict and loss of love. I mean, these are so true. I feel them deep in my heart. Um, and uh, this is the truth. This is the the our truths. Um, this is how we, um, perhaps a culture that we've created where they they are not held, um, and uh, in so many different environments, um, and it, it's it's something I find so sad. I I kind of look around me sometimes and and see so many frozen truths um, that uh, that are not held and and the consequences of that um thank you so much for everybody who did share oh one more um i have run in i have run into this through my processing my i'm sorry proposing a work to a granting process that was created by an art community they were asking me how i would make a process of theater safe i got frozen by that yeah it was a felt sense of their fear of how houseless folks yes Yes, definitely. Yeah. So there are very true consequences to um, expressing ourselves. Um, so when we meet um, with ourselves or with others in crisis, we have to realize that, that we're not just dealing with um, uh, you know this that that this is a real fear um and some of the artwork that i'll show you will, will, will express that as well so like i was saying is um the first thing we want to do is is um really create clarity around the frightening consequences of expressing ourselves within ourselves and and with others and and always honoring the reality and the truth of the potential pain for someone in expressing what they they believe or what we believe or think and i and the 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 first part here for me um is creating a context of low consequence which is sometimes hard because we create the con consequence within ourselves um we have a, a very imaginative mind of of what could happen um, even with just a word, I mean, you know, putting a word on a piece of paper, whatever that word might be for you. Um, we have, uh, even if we are in a safe container. So, so as, as, um, as witnesses, um, to ourselves and others, finding ways of lowering the consequence of our expression, which for me often is compassion where um and non-judgment um where you're assured that whatever comes out and this is a hard thing sometimes for people as we can see with the state of kind of um the modern relationship with suffering and and crisis is that it's hard even to trust within ourselves or each other that what we have to express is going to be held um, because for us, um, we are just, um, we are really, um, uh, you know, 
sort of lost in this this idea of um, judgment, judging judging um, those things. Um, and and I I, I want to go go further into this and and move to the next slide. Um, so this is a powerful piece, and and I'll um, read this. Um, this was done in the 90s. Um, this artist, um, and and I want to remind you as I as I show um, you these images, this is just the description. But as I show you the images of these artists, I really challenge you to try not to separate yourself from their experience as artists and put them in a different category. So um, and and make their make their ambition to communicate your ambition to communicate, and no different than yours. Um, even imagine what story this might be in your life. What thing would you overcome by fearlessly depicting it? Is a question I want you to ask yourself. What would it take for you to do this as well? So as you're looking at these um, artists. Um, uh, this is David Voynarovich, um, and um, it's a piece called Until One Day This Kid. So um, David was an uh, artist in the 1990s. He was a, a gay man um, during the AIDS crisis. And this is a um, depiction of him as a kid, the words behind him are describing all the ways that him expressing and being who he was, was met with consequences. And what's really, um, really uh, clear here is, is that we do face very real consequences in, in, um, in overcoming um, our fear of expression and finding pride and joy and and um, in who we are. Um, you can see, you know, that that David is is is. Um, it's hard for me to pronounce his last name, so I'm just calling him David. I apologize. <laughs> little little um, uh, compassion for myself there. <laughs> um, so uh, depicting himself as the all-American boy here, you know, he's, um, you know, this is in the 1950s. Um, that was a big deal. And all the words um, in the background, um, you know, are, are about sort of um, different ways that he was oppressed and, and uh, violence against him and things. Um, so um, this same dynamic exists for us every day in a variety of ways is that our truth, whatever our truth of ourselves is, that's sort of being frozen, um, that that uh, we, we can be silenced in this, this um, paralysis. Um, and the thing that's so wonderful is that we can find path towards uh, creativity and, and art making that and this expression that, um, can create pride and change and um, and justice um, uh, and, and in in the emotional crisis way, like the change we need, the uh, you know overcoming the helplessness in, in a situation. Um, so um, and and all it depends on is a safe space um, uh, for us to um, express those things. So this is not just, you know, a, a, a great artist who created a great piece of work um, that was bold and, and courageous. Um, we are doing this every day, every day in our lives. Um, so something that we should ask ourselves um, when we're facing uh, someone's communication um, is, is, is definitely to assess our reactive judgments um, and who is defining beauty and healing? Um, is it is it uh, me? Am I, am I defining it? But what does me mean? You know, is it is it the me that's related to my culture um, and and the part of my culture that disapproves of this kind of create this kind of expression, or my upbringing, or my job, my identity, or my role, or my fear? So asking ourselves um, these kinds of questions when we are faced, you know, with the salt and pepper shakers or, or with David's piece, 
what part of me is approaching this with judgment? Um, and then there's there's a, a real opening up of, of understanding why that is, and perhaps even knowing for yourself that um, you know things things that uh, that we judge normally um, you know are, are related to um, specific frameworks um, in our lives um, that that we can in in certain contexts. Um, remove ourselves from, especially in a, when we're trying to create an openness for someone else to express. Because we, we really do all have the power to reject someone else's truth. Um, and, and what we reject in each other day to day is how we create our communities. Um, and in the end, it's just truly a dynamic of power. So um, who has the power to create? Um, uh, and and what story has the most power in our lives, and what story uh, do we enforce on other people's lives? Um, and and can we challenge it for a moment and say, can I give this power to someone else's story? Can this other person's story be more important than my more important than my culture, more important than my upbringing, more important than my job or my identity, my fear? So can we give that gift of openness? And so shame too, I mean, shame um, is, I say sometimes that, um, you know, uh, shame puts pain between us and change. So it becomes a different journey when, when something that you're ashamed of, um, you know, really uh, uh, something that you've done that you, you don't like about your behavior or your thought or, or something you've expressed, something you've put on a paper, the shame is what puts a block between you and just noticing and, and changing um, or transforming the, the or understanding even um, the root of, of why that's happening. And so, you know, art um, can be this container for these um, subjectively shameful feelings um, and thoughts, or, or, or even identities, or, or even our bodies, so like I'll show, um, in the artwork I'm going to show you. Um, so uh, we're, we're able to kind of transform this shame through empowerment and acceptance. And you'll be surprised. I mean, I remember I read a book um, years ago that said something like shame to the it's something that's shameful to the mind is only beauty to the heart. Um, I think it was Brothers Karamazov, but it um, it really is true that um, the amount of things we are taught to be ashamed of, I mean, there's just too much. There's too much. Um, so challenging the idea of shame and being able to hold space for someone else um, to, to really push that boundary of what is shame. Because um, if we're having um, shame around something, um, someone else um, being able to sit with it and, and explore it with us um, in a non-judgmental, compassionate way is what transforms it into pride and, and, and beauty. And, um, you know, what a culture is ashamed of changes um, uh, so clearly with the momentum of those who express it openly. So just like David, um, as more gay men express themselves during that time, there's a change, there's a shift. You know, um, the next uh, piece I'm going to show is from a great artist, um, Shona McAndrew, um, and um, the it's a, a the description here I'll read really quick is um, the female person of color sitting on the edge of a bathtub, rubbing her feet with a painting on the wall of a lounging white woman, and there's here Sh Shona works a lot with body image. Um, and I was happy to hear today too, um, that she, um, has worked, she's worked so hard, um, with her, her work to, to, um, take these intimate moments with our bodies and sort of, you, you know, the little nod to this cultural ideal up on the wall, um, that sort of instills all this shame, um, is, is, uh, that she's done a bit of a self-portrait, um, which, um, I'm, I'm, I think is one of her first. Um, 
but uh, the, the idea of these the bigger bodies or or the the the, the black bodies or or these bodies that are are shamed in our culture um you know in this in um this way that depicting them in this beautiful way in this you know um in this medium um is is a way of loving as a way of compassion is a way of seeing that changes the culture and changes our understanding of each other it's it's a way of justice um, depicting our, our pain, depicting um, things that we are taught to be ashamed of or often are, are forced to be ashamed of. Um, you know, depicting them is, is, is an act of, of justice, in my opinion. Um, and, um, and just this wonderful way of changing um, a cultural story, a cultural narrative. Um, so, and I'll go a little quicker because I know I'm running out of time. Um, fear of mistakes and paralysis. Um, yes, turning the tables. Um, this is this is another way of um, play, which is turning the tables of of power in, in the improv. We turn the tables. So if the scene is um, slowing down and there's a dynamic of power where one person has power over the other, a good way to move it forward quickly is to um, the lower status person in the scene to to find something that creates a higher status for him. So, um, and often I think um, that turning of the tables uh, it really uh, needs to happen with a, a sense of play uh, or low low stakes. And um, as I mentioned before, um, there's an idea of you know adapting to limitations, which is such a beautiful. Um, thing in, in art. Uh, there's so many examples of artists creating, um, you know, in ways that are, are not conventional, um, that, that are adapt adaptations um, to, you know, um, what are called limitations. Um, so, um, uh, Benjamin Tran um, is a good example um, of somebody taking mistakes um, and moving with them. Um, he says, I make nothing impress impressive when I'm full of thoughts or I have a plan or if I'm afraid to take a risk. Art teaches me openness and to see the value in taking risks. It also teaches me that I can mend my own mistakes no matter how bad it initially appears. Everything is dynamic and be transformed into beauty. This applies to everything beyond drawing. And the image that I'm um, showing is, is sort of an irregular, um, shape formed with many designs made with black marker. So I'm sorry to uh, go a little quicker here, but um, anger, sadness, and oppression I'm going to end with. Um, and um, this is really about changing the narrative, um, ch shifting someone, your own or someone else's narrative. Um, I mean, we all have seen um, these kinds of um, pictures, uh, or maybe not, but um, this is um, a public set on the left here. I'm um, showing, uh, depicting a public statue of Edward Colston. And on the right is a public statue of a black female prot protester with her arm raised. So this is um, the one on the right here is, is called The Surge of Power by Jen Reed 2020. This is a, a black resin sculpture sculpted by Mark Quinn and modeled on Jean Reed, Jen Reed. Both Quinn and Reed are credited as artists. It depicts Reed, a black female protester, raising her arm in a black power salute. It was erected surreptitiously in the city of Bristol, England, in the early morning of the 15th of July, 2020. It was placed on an empty plinth from which a 19th century statue of Edward Colston, who had been involved in the Atlantic slave trade, had been toppled defaced and pushed into the city's harbor by George Floyd protesters in the previous month. The statue was removed by Bristol City Council the day after it was instill, installed. So this for me is such a beautiful reminder and example of empowerment and changing the narrative and how important art is in doing that that what we depict 
in public art and our own art is what the stories that we value. And that's so important. We, we create our world with how, we, with how and what we express and what we express becomes what we value. So I'll end here um, with, um, and I'm a little late and I apologize, but ways that we can take this into our lives. And if we're assuming that um, what we create changes what we value, as well as um, this journey towards um, seeing the world in a different way as uh, all selves as artists, all, all that we do as art, as creative, as generative, and as impactful as changing what we value through what we express, is that we can take this into our, our lives day to day. And I, I say this to myself a lot, is to breathe and to let others breathe into being and expressing themselves. Be patient, um, hold, have an intention of holding, non-judgmental, compassionate holding. And then, you know, if, if, as, a, as an experiment, notice how you best express yourself. Really try to pay attention to that for a day or two. And notice how the people around you um, express and succeed in expressing themselves. Um, and then experiment with new ways of communicating. Again, go forward with the sense of play. And always understand that that uh, or 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 try to 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 try on this this idea of that the reality we create is 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 a a system of value. So we create our worlds through what we value day to day. And if we commit ourselves to seeing all selves as artists, as creative, as generative beings, as trying to communicate, and at least source the intention in any moment that we can commit to valuing humanness, compassion, non-judgmental, non-judgment, adaptability, diversity, and creativity. And in this way, we can make changes in our own lives and others in our larger communities. So I know that last bit was a bit of a shot through, but um, I, I guess I'm ready for some questions. <laughs> I'm excited to hear um, what you all think. Thank you so much, Corinne. This was an amazing presentation. Um, I learned so much from it. So just Glad really, to hear. Glad to hear. yeah. Um, let me see where my Q&A went. Mm -hmm. I'm still learning a bit about this platform too. Um, we did get a lot of positive feedback about, That's good. yeah, quite a few positive comments saying how much people appreciated um, what, what you shared and um, all the perspectives. Um, so we do have our first question. Um, thank you, Karin. I'm wondering about definitions and their usefulness or mm -hmm. uselessness. I wonder if you see a difference between art and creativity. If all behavior is communication and all communication is a creative act, does that mean all behavior is art? And if so, why? And if not, why not? And does it matter either way? Oh, I love that. I love that. And and I almost like the, the last sentence best. Does it matter either way? <laughs> um, because I think that's the... Um, Thing that I try to go forward with. Um, uh, I talked a bit about context in the beginning. Um, the, and, and the idea that um, what we believe um, sometimes can be useful in some contexts and, and not useful in others. And um, the idea that uh, we are all artists and life is art and, and all this, um, it's, it's useful. Um, I guess for right now, um, and going forward, um, beliefs, uh, I tend to keep the ones that help me and throw away the ones that don't. So the, the, the inflexibility of beliefs, um, and def definitions, I guess, like you're saying, um, there tends to be a, a fluidity and, and that fluidity is based on usefulness 
or creating uh, more suffering. If if a belief creates more suffering, then I then I tend to throw it. Um, so I guess I guess the idea is it's a wonderful question and it's a wonderful conversation and I wish you know I had more time to to answer it. But um, I, I would really go back to the idea of um, uh, valuing uh, flexibility in in definitions and and understanding the impact of context. Um, and and the idea of playfulness around most things, <laughs> most right. Um, but uh, so especially when we're talking about language, um, sort of shuts it down if we're if we're trying to to pigeonhole um, something uh, into a, a belief or a meaning that that's solid and static. Thank you so much. Um, our next question is, do you think people have a fear of positive experiences in art making? Mm. <laughs> yeah, yeah, sure. Um, we could, we, we have fears of everything. <laughs> I think I have, I have fears of everything. I'm sure I've feared a positive experience in, in art making. Um, especially, I, I think for this, I'm thinking more of it in the context of, of a professional artist because um, there's this, and, and it definitely happens, I think, in, in a, a, a different context as well, in that you, you um, create something wonderful, you get such wonderful feedback, and then it's like, oh no, you know, it's almost like a, a fear of having to perform again and to, to have to create something great again. So that's another um, opportunity for us to be playful. I'm saying playful a lot today, but I guess that's that's the feeling is like, um, you know, if we've done something wonderful, you know, how great, and we've gotten this such wonderful positive feedback or this, but, um, you know, our tendency or my tendency is always to turn it into um, pressure and and fear of, of performing again. So this seems um, can it, it seems to be able to put us in a cycle of paralysis, which is which is harmful. Um, so using that as um, an opportunity to um, uh, in Buddhism they have a, the, this thing of not losing our seat in praise or blame, um, where we 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 are uh, it, it, there's a training you know to kind of be able to stay grounded um, with both. Um, so, you know, how, how we how we uh, journey through that uh, and, and find our way um, to not repeat um, and repeat this sort of feeling of pressure. And this is a journey for each of us, I guess. And I, I, um, I wish you luck. <laughs> Thank you for that answer. Um, and I wanted to share just a positive comment that we got. I appreciate you sharing your incredibly loving perspective of existence. Uh, I second that. Um, one other question is, I know Karin went over this already, but curious, would you share a little about the salt and pepper shaker meaning? Mm. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I guess, um, uh, you know, I, when I was thinking about telling that story, a, a part of me sort of uh, knew that that would be a question in, in that um, it, it didn't, uh, I don't know that it mattered what it meant. Um, I, it was so long ago, I was 21, um, but um, there are lots of ways you could approach that. Um, you know, I'm always looking at things in a dualistic way where so there's a there's a salt and pepper. So there's a duality. Um, it could be male, female, up, down, left, right. Um, you know, there, there could be so many different ways to um, to 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 frame um, with a beginning concept um, that, that would sort of lead you down a path of meaning of these salt and pepper shakers um, as someone witnessing um, and trying to hold space for what I was trying to say. But I guess the important point I wanted to make with that story is it didn't necessarily matter what I was um, trying to say in that moment, that, that, that it was more that there was space created where someone had the intention of learning that language. Um, so 
with a, with a series of, of compassionate um, questions and, and with a very grounded intention of, of seeing that act as art, um, what I was trying to communicate could have come forth, let's say. Um, but I, but honestly, I, I don't remember um, what I was trying to say <laughs> with the salt and pepper shakers. <laughs> Thank you so much. I think that's such a great point that it sounds like sometimes the process and just kind of um, the experience of being listened to and heard and engaged with is yeah, yeah. a more important component of art even than necessarily what exactly the meaning is or the content itself. Right, right. So true. Yeah, so we have another question here. Um, first and foremost, thank you so much for sharing. I did say earlier that I work in peer support and work with individuals with severe mental illness and co-occurring disorder. I'm no mm -hmm. artist, um, but would love to incorporate art therapy into my groups. My responsibility is to demonstrate recovery. Can you offer some tips or examples to use in my groups? I have many members who, have very creative, who are very creative and would love to use art to express themselves. Mm. Um, yeah, um, this would be something that I'd like to to talk more um, uh, about. Um, I know this talk was so broad, and um, I'm realizing how much I tried to cram into it. Um, but um, as far as you know, examples, um, I did mention a few things uh, just to save time. Uh, you know, in my creativity and um, uh, and COVID show, there were some like um, solid um, examples uh, of, of like um, practices that you can do. One I'm remembering is sort of all different sizes, paper, different, um, you know, pens um, um, that are bigger and smaller. And, and um, so, so I do have a few of those um, that could be accessed in that talk. Um, but, you know, feel free to reach out to me. Um, I also wanted to mention too, is that um, you know I I, I um, currently am um, you know working through getting some more of this stuff out into the world, my own artwork and and things like this, you know, um, practical applications of of this kind of um, perspective. And I have a Patreon um, that you can access um, through my website and support my work. Um, I'm uh, hoping someday it's a sort of a goal of mine to. Um, at least, um, you know, uh, create a space in New Jersey, a Soteri House or, or um, peer respite of some sort that, um, and I know those two are different, but um, still sort of working that out. Um, uh, but in New Jersey, um, that, that um, these kind of perspectives would be um, partially part of that. So, um, so check, check out my Patreon at some point, and if you'd be willing to support that, um, I would love to. Um, to um, you know, uh, have your have your have your support, but um, yeah, practical examples. Um, I'm hoping to have more of them <laughs> for you all. I'm sorry I don't have um, those uh, accessed accessible at this very moment. But thank you for that question. Thanks so much. And yeah, it sounds like a peer respite or soteria based in these principles would be so needed and so valuable. So yes. Yeah, and, and all the the most, I mean, the donations to this Patreon um, basically are are going towards this aim of creating a space here in New Jersey based on this stuff. Yeah. Awesome. Um, we have another great question. Um, great presentation. Could you further share how to help someone who is blocked because of traumatic experiences of their work being critiqued harshly by parents and academia? Oi, oi, goodness, yeah. Yeah, yeah, it's, and and so, um, so many of us are, um, um, and and I'm not, um, you know, I don't want to, um, I want to validate, you know, everyone's experience is different in this too, but but in some way, I also want to say is that the the act of crushing young artists is so common um, from young age to to college um, and beyond. Um, the idea of, of it, it seems to be culturally embedded that we need to put each other down um, in, in our expressions. 
um, whether that's a, a, a framework of, of, you know, created by by the culture um, of of um, whatever, uh, however, uh, whatever framework you want to most blame for that. <laughs> but um, so, and I'm sorry you experienced that, and and uh, know that you're not alone um, in that. Um, and and that that's a, a journey. It's a process. Um, finding um, those witnesses who aren't going to um, criticize and judge you in that traumatic way, finding your own space, um, trusting in yourself that you're not going to judge yourself because we internalize that 100%. We internalize that criticism. So that voice is in you. Um, so I found for myself um, really uh, spending so much time in in uh, solitude and not not lonely solitude, you know, solitude that was purposeful in trying to hear my own voice and to love and 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 have compassion for the deepest darkest things that I could imagine about myself. Um, we shore ourselves up to meet criticism um, and meet these these crushers of <laughs> of creativity with with playfulness. Um, and and uh, not you know, playfulness sort of does seem to, uh, to in some way um, feel a little invalidating of, of how scary that is. But but um, you know, in this way of understanding that when we give power to someone to criticize, um, that's where it all starts to fall apart. Um, and uh, so. So I wish you so much luck. Um, I would just, I guess my advice is to sit and find your own compassionate voice towards yourself that you can shore up and, and find confidence in um, so that, uh, you know, and then find people who can sit and be with you and hold your creativity in, in a compassionate way. That's great advice. Thank you so much. Um, we have another comment here and a question. An astonishing presentation. Thank you. Deeply moving and helpful examples. Do you have or know of any venues that actually support people in crisis to explore their own values? Um, and we create our world through what we value in my experience. Um, the unempowered have often been deprived or shamed out of a sense of what they value. Mm -hmm. How build that connection? Yeah, I, I uh, spent um, maybe the last six months um, in this kind of question. Um, I, I don't know of any spaces. Um, uh, I mean, there, there are plenty of spaces that are, are deeply uh, and, and um, dedicated to, to empowerment, um, like the Wildflower Alliance and, and others like that, that I always mention. Um, but um, it's for me, it's been a journey, um, an extremely uh, deep one, where I've had to redefine for myself um, what I value. And um, one of the, the things I really um, was so profoundly affected by were just the words that um, uh, reality is a value system. Um, and however deeply that uh, you know is drawn into your your body and your heart and your mind, um, there's so much to discover there. So just knowing there is a connection between reality and what we value, between our culture and what we value, um, and then really determining. Um, for me, there was a sense of knowing that what I valued wasn't necessarily so in line with what others uh, around me did. Um, and, and maybe it was, it was that sort of negative um, or, or the opposition that I was like, wait, I, I don't value that. So, so that's an interesting um, pathway towards finding what it is that you do value instead. But it's a journey um, uh, that I've been on myself. So I wish you luck as well. Um, and hopefully we will find more places where 
disempowered people are empowered to find what they value because it's so important. Thank you so much for sharing that. And I really appreciate you bringing your personal experience into this too. Um, we have time for just one more. Mm -hmm. um, so our final question um, is what is sometimes too much appreciation can paralyze you. And do you have any thoughts on that? Oh yeah, I think that was similar to the question before. Um, oh my goodness, yes. Um, so I think another thing we're not used to being in um, is is uh, is valuable, <laughs> um, and we're not taught how to be valuable people because um, we're often so encouraged to be devalued. Um, so when we suddenly um, are of this, you know group of valued beings um, who has the talent and artists run into this a lot because you know um, there's this strange dichotomy of at once devaluing artists and overvaluing or not over I'm sorry devaluing artists and then and then valuing them quite um, a lot so for artists it's, it's a very um, strange um, experience um, because one you're not you know getting paid. <laughs> And then to you know, or or um, you know, by in in a way that like say a scientist would get paid, um, but uh, you know, then in the other um, in the other uh, direction and the opposite, you're you're absolutely um, you know in some cases um, being admired in in this strange un, unsustainable way. So um, I, I um, that too is is a journey that's. Um, that's, I think, at the core is um, maybe going back to that de idea where um, if you are admired and, and you're doing wonderful work and, and that that's paralyzing you, perhaps you're losing your seat, as I was saying um, before with the, the Buddhist um, philosophy of, of losing your seat in the face of praise and blame, um, finding that way to stay grounded in both. And uh, that's that's a lot. Um, but good luck to you <laughs> and thank you for that question. Thank you for that response. Um, I think that's all the questions we have time for, but before we wrap up, I was wondering if maybe you could put your website and contact info and Patreon um, into the chat so people sure, can- Sure, sure. Yeah, so I will do that right now. Awesome, thank you. You can access my Patreon um, from the website, so I'll just put that in there. And my email I will put in here as well. Perfect. And open to, you know, hearing from all you all. And thank you so much for for being with me today and spending this time with me. And I appreciate it. I appreciate your attention and, and your you're listening. So thank you. Yeah, thank you so much for being here and giving this amazing presentation. It was really moving. And I think everyone here found it very valuable. So just appreciating it. And thank you everyone for joining us today. And um, we will be announcing our next webinar in this series, as well as our youth leadership series um, through our email listserv. So please, um, Feel free to join our mailing list and stay tuned for those. Um, we hope you have a happy holiday season and hope to see you back at our future webinars. Hmm. Bye, everybody.